Hi, I'm Mike Fisher. I'm a fellow at the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina, and I'm going to be talking about collecting high quality water quality data. We'll begin with talking about the motivation for this topic, why data quality matters, and defining what we mean by data quality, as well as the types of data we want to collect for water quality monitoring programs, and some of the sources of error and bias that can creep into our water quality monitoring data. We'll talk about steps that we can take to prevent and correct errors and bias, and drill in, in particular, on quality assurance and quality control methods, and how they can help us improve data quality, as well as how we can implement QA, QC methods in routine monitoring programs. Finally, we'll talk about a few notes and experiences from the Water Institute's uh, experience implementing water quality monitoring with different partners in a variety of global settings, and some next steps and a little bit of speculation about how technology may continue to enable uh, more rapid and efficient quality assurance and quality control to help us improve data quality for making decisions. To begin with, our motivation in water quality monitoring, as with all monitoring, is to generate evidence fit for purpose for making decisions to improve the health of populations. There's a, a quote from uh, Bill Fagey, former director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, about surveillance generally that I think is uh, also applicable to water quality monitoring. Um, and uh, he asserts that data collection and analysis should not be allowed to consume resources if action does not follow. Appropriate action, therefore, becomes the ultimate goal and the final assessment of the earlier steps of a surveillance system. In other words, we shouldn't be collecting water quality monitoring data unless we're going to leverage those to make decisions to protect populations. Therefore, if our data are of poor quality and they're not fit for decision-making purposes, we're not really making efficient use of our monitoring tools and resources. And therefore, it's really important to collect high-quality data that can inform high-quality decisions to protect populations and improve the safe management of water. There are several dimensions of data quality that we can consider. When we're talking about data quality, we first and foremost need to make sure that data are available to the decision makers who need them, both in terms of uh, being produced, being made available, and being made available in a format and in a way that makes them understandable and accessible and usable. Completeness and timeliness are fairly straightforward. When we talk about validity, we mean that, uh, that the response that's collected is a valid response for the question being asked, and that our methods are broadly valid. Accuracy means not only is our response valid, but the recorded information actually matches the physical reality of the thing we're measuring to the greatest extent possible. And consistency means that when two different enumerators within the same organization measure the same thing, they're going to get consistent responses. In other words, if two enumerators measure the pH of a given water sample, they're going to get consistent and comparable results. And also, to the extent possible, it's desirable to collect data in a method that makes results consistent and comparable across organizations so that we can begin to think about aggregating water quality information at the local, national, and international level to help inform our understanding of progress and help inform decisions to improve uh, water quality, safely manage water, and progress on national and international targets. There are several types of data that we want to collect, not only physical, chemical, and microbial parameters of our water quality samples at the source and household level, but we also need associated characteristics. For example, uh, the date, time, and location where the sample is being collected, uh, the type of source or, or uh, household source from which it's being obtained, um, and other associated information about the uh, water sample that we're collecting to enable us to understand what the data are telling us about if we have water quality problems, where and when are they occurring, and what might be some of the potential determinants that we can use to understand. One, where is progress occurring? Where are we potentially having issues? What might be some potential causes? And how can we potentially manage those water quality issues to get better outcomes? We'll use different data collection methods to do this. So we'll use, uh, for example, um, instruments and water quality tests to collect a lot of our water quality parameters. But we might also use direct observation, for example, of source type or different sanitary inspection characteristics at a water source. Uh, and we'll also use questionnaires to find out things that can't be directly observed in the moment. For example, to learn who implemented a water source, if there isn't uh, obvious markings there to tell us that, when a source was implemented, 
uh, or uh, for example, the last time it broke down. And sometimes we can also con consult records and secondary data to understand, for example, the depth of a well or a borehole, uh, the date and method of construction, etc. For each of the different types of data that we're collecting, error and bias can creep in, and this can happen at many different stages, both in the design and development of our monitoring uh, methods and study, uh, the uh, sampling, deciding where we're gonna collect samples, also the training of uh, enumerators and the piloting, the sample collection itself, uh, transport and analysis of samples, and data entry are all places where errors can occur. So for example, if we design a monitoring system that includes uh, poorly specified indicators uh, or uh, doesn't include very good survey questions, they might be ambiguous, then we may get results that aren't really very usable or comparable. So different people might ask the question in different ways. They might understand responses and classify them differently. Uh, or for example, we may have different operational definitions. So uh, two different people may apply a water quality test in a very different way. They might uh, wait different amounts of time to read the results, et cetera. And these can result in unusable data that can't be compared across context samples and enumerators. We can also have issues around training and piloting that can again lead to uh, inconsistency uh, or, or low quality data. Sample collection is an important point at which proper sterile technique is really required to get usable microbial data. So if we use non-sterile sample collection containers or we don't use proper sterile technique, so we're handling, for example, the insides of containers that need to remain sterile, there's the risk that we can introduce microbial contamination, making our results unusable. Similarly, sample transport, if we don't observe appropriate cold chain and hold times, uh, and we transport our samples in such a way that they sit out in the hot sun and become pasteurized, then we'll get false negatives for our microbial data, for example, uh, and they can become unusable, particularly if we don't know which samples have been affected. Similarly, if we're doing uh, chemical analyses, um, if we do them in the field, we need to make sure that our field instruments are properly calibrated and maintained. Uh, and if we transport them for analysis at a laboratory, we need to make sure that we're doing appropriate sample preservation where that's necessary to make sure that the concentrations when the sample is analyzed are representative of the concentrations that were there when the sample was collected. Finally, there's lots of different ways that data entry errors can occur. And if we don't manage those properly, we can get data that are unusable. Finally, we need to think not only about the impact of these types of errors and biases, but also how likely we are to catch them if they're occurring um, and therefore be able to take appropriate action to address them. Now, there's several different examples of preventive and corrective measures that we can take to prevent error and bias. And these include uh, proper design of our monitoring system, using validated methods, uh, core questions and indicators and uh, other resources that are available to us whenever possible and where we need to create or adapt uh, questions, making sure that we validate and pilot those uh, as well as any types of um, water quality sampling tools, methods, and tests, making sure that they are uh, validated um, either by others or that we are able to adequately validate themselves, them ourselves before using. Appropriate training and piloting can help avoid a lot of problems. And when it comes to sample collection, transport, and analysis, the use of quality assurance and quality control samples, for example, field blanks and duplicates can be very helpful. So a blank sample uh, that is known to be free from uh, microbial uh, contamination and to have uh, very low levels of uh, criteria chemical contaminants, much lower than the levels we're looking for, and have physical chemical characteristics within sort of defined norms, if we see that those blanks are coming up with very high levels of the things we're looking for, that's a clue that we may have problems with our sample collection, transport, or analysis. And similarly, when we take duplicate samples uh, from the same uh, source or household, if we see more variability in those, the results of those two duplicates than can be explained, then we might suspect that we need to tighten up our sample collection, transport, or analysis methods. Finally, uh, mobile survey tools can be very useful for reducing some types of data entry errors. Uh, and there's a number of tools such as MWater, Ocvo, SurveyCTO, and others that have features that can help us uh, improve data quality and avoid data entry errors. There's a number of different ways that we can implement QAQC methods into routine monitoring. This includes regularly reviewing submissions 
in uh, a timely manner and flagging results that uh, look improbable, as well as we can apply logical checks. So for example, we know the range within which pH values should fall. And so if we start seeing lots of entries of pH values of zero or one or 20, 30, uh, impossible or implausible values, we know it's very likely that we have a problem somewhere and we can drill down to see what type of error might be causing that. Photo validation can be very useful. So anywhere that enumerators are measuring or observing something we can take a picture of, for example, a water source type, that can be very useful because we can go back and check a subset of those photos against the recorded responses to ensure that we're getting high quality data there. Finally, uh, GPS coordinates and timestamps can be recorded every time a uh, water quality sample is collected and analyzed. And this can help us confirm that samples are being collected and analyzed where and when we think that they're being uh, collected. Field blanks and duplicates are QAQC samples, again, can be instrumental. And typically, 5 or 10% of samples, if those are QC samples, that can help us ensure that our uh, water quality analysis methods are uh, being implemented appropriately. Lab blanks and duplicates can be useful if we're doing any analysis in a laboratory. And it can be helpful to revisit a random subset of sites to confirm that uh, Items that should be relatively stable over time, for example, what type of water source it is, where it's located, um, and some things, for example, like fluoride and conductivity that shouldn't vary wildly over time, uh, ensure reasonable consistency of repeated measures. Although, of course, we're not going to expect perfect consistency for things like microbial contamination, which can fluctuate uh, quite a bit over time. In implementing QAQC in a routine monitoring system, it's helpful to plan for it from the beginning, implement it during training and piloting, and scale our QC methods as needed to ensure that we get high quality data. Wherever possible, we can automate checks uh, to, to use rule-based validation to make sure that our, our results uh, are at least uh, are have reasonable validity and give rapid feedback as quickly as possible so that teams in the field can find out if there's anything they need to change about the way that we're collecting, transporting, or analyzing samples. Based on our experience, we found that it can be very useful to track data collection times. If a survey is supposed to take 10 or 15 minutes and you see that some enumerators are completing it in one or two minutes or one or two hours, that may flag a possible problem and you can follow up to see what's going on there. Generally, if QC samples such as blanks and duplicates are labeled just like every other sample, that can improve their ability to uh, accurately detect whether problems are occurring. We find that it's incredibly valuable to hire and retain top enumerators as they can pass on institutional knowledge to new recruits, and that it's helpful if enumerators understand how the QA QC process works so that they can help make sure that it's working smoothly. Finally, it's important to note that mobile survey tools and data analysis tools are continuing to advance. And so we're getting ever increasing opportunities to automate some of the uh, logical checks and reviews as data are coming in that can help us improve our quality assurance and quality control. This can help us get faster feedback, flag problems quicker, but it's important to recognize that for the foreseeable future, we'll always need humans in the loop to understand why data quality problems might be occurring and what we can do to better manage and prevent them. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and invite you to reach out if you have any additional questions after this session. I also wanna share a few resources that may be helpful for you if you wanna read up further on this topic.